Hello, everybody. Welcome to Game Audio Hour number 75. It's our weekly podcast. We discuss all things game audio from creative ideas to the latest techniques, project experience, audio secrets. Here's where you find your in-depth coverage and opinions related to game audio. Who's got a TV on? Do you hear a TV? That's probably uh, some construction going on outside here in Japan. Is you know, it? <laughs> put your mic up to it or something. I wonder what they're saying. Yeah, that's good. I'll just run outside and put it right <laughs> next to that uh, hydraulic hydraulic jackhammer out there. It sounds... Uh, you could capture your own sound effects library right now of work. Construction. <laughs> um. <laughs> uh. hey, I'm, I'm going to skip Alex because Alex thought I was going to go to him because we were talking about it, but I went right to Vince. The curveball. Hello, hello. Oh, I'm doing all right. Uh, I'm not doing my hot water. I've got my big old thermos of ice water here. Uh, good old uh, Zoji Rushi. I'm a big fan of these Japanese thermos bottles. They're, they're pretty fantastic because uh, the air conditioning in here has been on the fritz. Not a horribly hot day in L.A., but, man, it can be really bad. When you don't have air conditioning. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and mine broke, which is right there. Oh. It has been... I got, I have a dual split, so the live room has one, and then I have one in here, and this the live room works, but this one doesn't. And yeah, yeah, of course, this is not the time for your air conditioning to break. Alex, how's your air conditioning working? We're not actually using air conditioning right now. It is a beautiful autumn day in Japan. Actually, the last week has been really, really nice. We had a few convenient typhoons that come up and sweep up the heat, the heat and... <laughs> Shifted over there to uh, across the Pacific to you guys, so we were uh, nice and nice and cool. Yeah. I did see a weather map. I don't know how uh, how realistic or accurate it was, but because I can't remember what the source was, but basically it was a weather map showing all of this heat coming through. They were blaming China in the map. Yeah, you know, when in, when in doubt, just blame China. That's the way that the mass media works, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, it is. I, I realized as I was saying it, I really didn't have anything to offer <laughs> except <laughs> right to the point, which was basically they were blaming China. Right. Uh, and how are you, Kyle? How are you? I'm good. I had to race right here, and so I'm a little bit frazzled. You can probably tell my voice because I had to run in the door and throw down the stuff and grab the scotch because it's mandatory and um, start the show, which means we are a couple minutes late. Sorry about that. We should probably uh, just inform viewers that uh, we're going to be back to the good old tried and true, the old yeah. faithful Google for uh, the Google Hangouts for doing this broadcast because we uh, we gave it a go, didn't we, Twitch, but it just didn't seem to work out too many complications. It was, it was, it was you know, I, I don't, I think it's a good idea to talk about it because especially if uh, people are looking to do this kind of thing, there are ways to get your, your video podcast to go to Twitch. Uh, there are much easier ways, like if you just want to record your yourself playing a video game on your PS4, it goes straight through. You know, some brains behind Sony have figured out how to connect that PS4 to Twitch connection, and I think Xbox has one, too. I don't have it, the latest Xbox. Um, but when you're trying to use a bunch of third-party softwares and chain them together and get it all to flow, it didn't flow very well. Um, we got, we, we'd get video going, and it looked pretty good, and Mike didn't drop out as often, which was odd. Um, but then the audio, when I listen back to the shows, like I'd be super quiet and other people would be loud or the reverse would happen. And, um, you have to use an outboard mixer, you know, so I'm trying to control levels over here. I'm using a software for shots over there. Um, it just it just wasn't as... I mean, the whole reason we went that way was because basically we were experiencing some dropouts on Hangouts. In the meantime, while we're over trying to check out Skype slash Twitch solution, Hangouts comes up with some new uh, some new drivers and a little bit more stability. So um, I think that our best case scenario that makes it simple for our show, especially with no budget, is to uh, to just stick with the Hangouts. So I'll be taking the Twitch stuff off. Unfortunately, though, uh, although we don't have a, uh, a lot of Twitch viewers, at least I'm not hearing from them. So if they're out there, uh, it. it Please send us an email and let us know. If there's billions of people watching on Twitch, and all of a sudden, you know, they go, "Hey," then yeah, of course we'll stay. But um, I I only know of one or two people that are seeing us on Twitch. So um, I was going to take it off. I thank you for sticking with us and trying this transition. Um, but uh, yeah, you can just look for us in the traditional ways that we've always been, which is on YouTube, and uh, and via 
the Hangouts, and then uh, we post it up to Apple a little bit later uh, when Brian has a chance to do some editing and uh, push the videos up there. Yay! Sorry. Yay! I can't believe that the. Uh, I'm trying to hear what that is. I'm hearing. I don't know if you guys are hearing it, but I'm hearing like. I don't think it's construction. I'm hearing like a meeting or television or something. It's probably me. If you oh, listen it? closely, maybe you'll be able to hear what uh, <laughs> the latest from that game company. Um, they are definitely talking, and they're talking quite loudly. Oh, no worries, no worries. It is not interrupting the show. It's just. It's kind of interesting. Let's, uh, let's take a moment and figure out what that game company is releasing next. Oh, man. Maybe I should just turn it down a little bit. Let's turn it down. <laughs> there we go. That was secret this. game. Too late. Somebody with some, like, master RX skills is going to take what we've already done and, and assign you guys as the next Call of Duty studio. <laughs> oh, so, man. Uh, <laughs> we, will, uh, we will actually, uh, in regards to today's topic... Um, Vince had a, a really interesting email to us about uh, workflow for sound effects production and workflow for, workflow for music production, which I thought was really timely and a kind of interesting topic because a lot of guys are um, you know tasked with doing both at once, and uh, the way that pe- you know the way that people are approaching both sound effects and music production. Uh, so Vince's question in the topic, which I thought was quite fascinating, was: um, Is it is it well, how do you approach sound effects production versus music production? Do you use the same kind of workflow, same kind of software, or completely different workflow? Or do you, uh, you know, how, did, how does it all come together in the two facets? I, so, do, uh, I do it with slide whistles and those zip things that you spin. <laughs> and ju- juice hops? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Those, those are the best. Oh. Hanna-Barbera has got nothing on me. Oh, perhaps a little more seriously. Um, uh, it, it, I'm not sure I really made a conscious decision towards this, but you know, I'm kind of a, a two-daw guy. I use both Cakewalk Sonar. I, I've used that thing for 15 years, and I also use Reaper. And I'm, I'm rather newer at that, although I've been using it off and on for the last four years. And basically, I find that when I do music... I, I'm better, I'm faster, I just, I, I like working within the Cakewalk Sonar environment, and I find that I do everything that I want to do really quite nicely in there. Um, but then there's Reaper, and I remember trying to really hammer my music workflow into that, and I thought, uh, this kind of works, maybe I'll, maybe I'll try using this a little bit more later on for the next project. And actually, what ended up happening is that for straight up sound effects production. I need to make a sound effect really quick and dirty for an editor friend of mine. I'll take some library sounds, I'll do some effects, I'll, I'll, I'll do some really quick uh, clean cutting between stuff and boom, there's my sound. And I did it all in Reaper instead of Sonar. Even though I know all the key shortcuts in Sonar, I'm pretty quick on that, but Re- Reaper just seemed to just seems to do it for me when it comes to sound effects production, and there's this very strong demarcation for me in my workflow. And I and I wonder if anyone else does anything like that, where they work in two different environments for these two things. Well, I do. I work well. Uh, yeah, I do. I use um, Ableton for sound effects primarily, and Logic. I do more Logic for music nowadays, although. Last couple of projects were back on Ableton. Hmm. Yeah. What about you? Why, Alex? Uh, why did you uh, previously? You mentioned that current. You know, most recent projects are uh, back in Ableton. But previously, what was it about Logic that made it easier for you to do music as opposed to using Live for that? I had a bunch of five one stuff. Ah, oh, right. That's right. Surround sound. Yeah. And so it drags me out. And and I'm starting to feel like Logic is like at second muscle now because I've been an Ableton user so long. I think I might actually know Logic better than I know Cubase, and Cubase is where I was for, you know, over a decade and until I, Ableton came along, and so I would keep going back to Cubase with little little 5.1 projects or something like that, or just mostly out of entertaining myself, you know, just seeing if I could flex that muscle again. But um, but uh, I, think Ableton, or, uh, I think Logic now I know better than 
Cubase at this point. So I'm kind of the same, Vince. I've kind of, mm -hmm. but no matter what, if I want to do sound effects, I go straight to Ableton. I don't go anywhere else. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I um, uh, for the past uh, year and a half now, I've been affiliated with the the Vitae backroom in Kyoto. They basically, when when I turned up, uh, the basically I was needing to make sound effects and music. And they just said, "Yeah, we don't care what. Just use whatever you like. We don't. We don't care how you do it." So because, because uh, music, I've always you know used synthesizers, as you know, and very few sample libraries. I thought, well, you know, sound effects, I may as well just do it the same way. So, <laughs> intentionally, just because it's how I work fastest, working in trackers in Renoise, that's just the way that it came about. You know, uh, for sound effects production as well, just doing synthesized sound effects in Renoise. And the thing is that once you get over um, not being able to see your waveform, for mm. example, when you have like a, like any other traditional DAW, you actually see a graphical representation of the waveform, mm -hmm. and then if you, you know you turn off grid snapping, and now you can move things around and adjust gain curves and stuff like that. Once you get over not being able to see that and doing everything in numbers instead, um, you're actually doing exactly the same thing. And the other, the other, at least for me, the other um, uh, advantage of using Renoise is that Renoise has a very good uh, destructive sample editor built into it is basically mm -hmm. like the old trackers Renoise is basically a sampler mm -hmm. so basically a huge hugely capable sampler which uh, with you know with the capability to run VST AU uh, plugins as well and so um, uh, when it comes to uh, editing samples you've got the sample editor right there so you don't need to jump between you know audition or, or twisted wave or whatever you're using uh, you can just keep it all within the one program, and the cool thing is that a bit like uh, I've, the mighty Jack Minhorn, who used to use um, Ableton for doing uh, sound effects production, was always uh, talking about how wonderful the clip launching view is for doing sound effects experimentation. You have some of those benefits as well with a tracker pattern based system, where, for example, if I'm doing a synthesized, uh, for example, an explosion, so I'll have it in one pattern, so I'd have everything set up in one pattern. If I want to render out, say, 16 variations of that explosion because they're synthesized, so they're going to be slightly different every time, all I need to do is just re-trigger the same pattern 16 times. Then you just set Renoise to render every pattern to an individual file, and there you go. You, you don't have to do any editing. You've got you know 16 variations on your sound effects right there. Um, so it's not really a kind of workflow that I would recommend to people who are not you know very familiar with working with trackers and. Uh, it is sort of like squashing this big square peg into the round hole, but uh, yeah, it, for me, the the point being, of course, the workflow of sound effects versus music, things just kind of came together just because, like you, Vince, with Sonar, I know Renoise so well now that it just just it works just a lot faster that way. Wow. Uh, well, you know, for as you know, square peg round hole as it can be, I I really like the the character of it. It just uh, maybe that sounds all touchy feely, but it's um, it just when you describe it that way, it just sounds so cool, and I can't help but think, of course you do it that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think um, uh, for at least for the project I'm working on, there was a, a huge amount of VO stuff that had to be edited in batch, and of course in that situation, it's just ridiculous to try and do that in a in a tracker program. So actually, I used um, uh, a Reaper to do that. And, yeah, Matt is just saying in the, the chat room, uh, Matt is asking yeah. if, Vince, did you have to do a lot of customization to get a decent workflow flow with Reaper? And um, <clears throat> the as Matt says, yeah, Reaper behaves so differently from everything. However, it's so, you know, wonderfully customizable that for doing all of this uh, VO editing and VO production and batch outputting and all this kind of processing that we had to do, uh, Reaper was fantastic. You know, and as you're using it, you think, oh, it'd be kind of good if that was there. You just move it there. It'd be kind of mm -hmm. good if I could, you know, trigger this sequence a little faster than having to go through these menu menus. You just, you know, assign it to a key. Um, you know, it's so, it'd be kind of good if I could see my waveforms in this way instead of that way. And then, you, you know, you just set it up like that. So, you know, there yeah. was a, um, you know, you mentioned uh, Renoise and the, and the fact that it has that destructive sample editor. And uh, there was a talk that was done at GDC a couple years ago that was talking about 
uh, just sort of extolling the virtues of destructive sample editing versus typical non-destructive editing in your nonlinear editors and your DAWs. And uh, that actually really resonated with me at the time because I used SoundForge a lot. And before that, things like Goldwave and other sort of less professional sample editors. And I was very fond of actually doing a lot of micro-editing with the pencil tool on the waveform itself. I was just yeah. a big fan of that. And uh, moving, uh, moving on to Reaper, I found that I'm actually not doing a whole lot of destructive editing at any point when I'm making a lot of my samples or, or my sound effects these days. Uh, before, it would be this combination of sonar, get to a certain point, export to uh, uh, render it out, throw it in SoundForge, do a little bit of tweaking here and there. OK, that's cool. But now I find that I'm actually doing a whole lot of stuff in Reaper and not really worrying too much about doing anything in a destructive manner as I used to enjoy back in the day. So it's it's just weird that my, my brain is deciding to shift things a little bit and my body just has to follow along for the ride. Mm. Do you think um, um, when you're approaching sourcing sounds, like it's a bit, like I mentioned, I, I tend to go towards using synthesis for everything. So. Uh, you know, if the guy need the guys need like the sound of a, a car door closing, then I just you know synthesize that. Um, mm -hmm. Takes me about maybe with a good reference to work from. Takes me about maybe sixty minutes to kind mm -hmm. of make a put the synths together and make like a car door closing sound, which is you know of varying degrees of realism depending on what's needed. And uh, um, so that again, I do it that way because the guy has just said to me, "We don't care how you work." Just do what, just do it the way you like to do it. So I said, okay, well, I'll just use this then. So I don't actually end up using that many sample libraries. But yeah, you actually also meant in your um, when you're suggesting the topic, you mentioned uh, um, different options for sourcing sound effects from libraries. So what do you guys do in that uh, for that? Wow, sixty minutes. Oh, I'm <laughs> just thinking like if someone asked me to do a a car door. Uh, uh, and I guess it depends on my relationship with the guy. I'm like, oh, you want a car door? Let me look through what I got. And I do have a couple of DVDs and CDs of uh, general purpose sound libraries. Um, not too crazy. I don't have anything like the big Series 6000 or, or all those. But uh, um, what do I have? I have this four DVD collection. It's a general purpose sound library called Studio Box. And I got it because it was really cheap. It was something like 300 bucks for four DVDs worth of a whole lot of sound effects, which is actually really good value if you just need a whole lot of sound effects to work on. Um, and that gets me through a whole lot of stuff. Um, so last week, a friend actually asked me, oh, man, I did this trailer. I cut it, and there's this temporary... Uh, tape rewind scrubbing sound that I do not have the permission to actually use. Can you make me something really quick, like in the next hour, and so I could send this off? I'm like, uh, okay. So I go into my library, I grab uh, like six or seven different sounds, I cut them up, I massage them, I, I splice things together, and in about 15, 20 minutes, I get just the right sound that sort of approximates the feel that he had, fits in the right place in the, in the trailer that he cut, and uh, boom, I'm on my way. <laughs> and I thought, wow, I wish I could have done that even faster. And then I hear that, whoa, 60 minutes. It's kind of mm -hmm. nice that you're afforded that much time to, to do a, a cool sound like that. Yeah, it depends on the, the actual sound itself. Like in... in um, uh... Some things that you, you kind of get used to, you know immediately what to do to, to produce a certain sound. Like, for example, with the car door, you know that you, you start by thinking about the actual physical thing that's happening. So you've got this, the sound of metallic clicks as the latch hits the, the, the kind of, what do you call it, like the, the latch of the door hits the latch of the chassis of the car. Mm -hmm. You've got that, and that mechanism is clicking away. Then you've got the resonance that happens because of this big sheet of metal of the door that's kind of vibrating as it closes. So you kind of split it into, into groups, and then you just work on each one of them, and then you mash it all together. Um, and you know that, for example, uh, you know, uh, the car door, I found that for if you want to simulate the sound of a metallic sheet, if you take white, if you take pink noise, you put it through a bandpass, and then you drive the filter, 
like overdrive the filter and then add a tiny little bit of uh, more white noise or pink noise just to create sort of a little tail of resonance behind it. Sounds a lot like you're hitting a sheet of metal. <laughs> Great. Nice. But, so once once you once you sort of get as you go through it, you sort of learn little tricks that oh okay, um, uh, I had to make like the sound of popping bubbles. That was really interesting as well because you know you know that uh, like a drum, the way that a wave will work is is you know that you um, start with very compressed waves as as the air gets compressed when something hits, and then it gradually kind of you know uh, the the wavelength gra- gradually increases as the sound continues. A popping bubble is the is the opposite because you've actually got air inside that's being uh, how does right. I kind of justified it to myself scientifically the other day, but I've forgotten how to explain it. But instead of taking a waveform, taking the wavelength and rapidly expanding it, you take the waveform and take the rapidly, you take the wavelength and rapidly compress it, and then you get like a kind of a pop sound. That basically means raising the pitch. So Mm -hmm. the good thing about doing it this way is that when the guys say to you, as did happen last week, we need the sound of a car driving into a plastic... uh, do you call them portaloos in the states? I've you know, never when heard that. I know what you're talking about. Porta potty. Porta potty. Yeah. We need the sound of a car driving into a plastic porta potty. Can you whip, <laughs> whip one of those up for us? Oh sure, <laughs> no problem. You have to kind of think about how plastic resonates now in, in the side of this big chamber with like this porcelain thing in the middle of it. <laughs> oh, that's good fun. That's I mean, it does sometimes it does take a long time. Like um, uh, we needed the sound of a clock tower bell. And uh, that took quite a while to get it sounding exactly like a large clock tower bell. Uh, so I used um, Native Instruments Prism, the modal synth- comb, synth- comb modal synthesis, to do that uh, with all the nice overtones. That was uh, that was good fun. But sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes it's really quick. Wow. I mean, that sounds really cool. I mean, I, I mean, I, I like doing some synthesis stuff. Um, I like actually. I, I think we mentioned before that I really like doing the physical modeling thing for for certain things. So sometimes for musical instruments as well as for other types of impacts and and UI stuff. Um, oh man, yeah, I, that's right. I love chromophone. I know you don't like chromophone, but um, I didn't like it. But, you know. Well, it, it doesn't quite. Well, I acknowledge that chromophone has some faults, but uh, I do a lot of work in order to do envelopes on chromophone that you can't otherwise do in order to make it sound pretty good and pretty controllable. Um, so I like doing those types of sounds, but I also have you know, my libraries. And so I've got this basic library, and I use that for certain things. Um, but, uh, but I wonder sometimes you know, if it's really that useful to have uh, this big old library, uh, especially with all the other options that are out there. Um, you know, there's uh, these online libraries these days where if I need a sound effect, okay, I'm going to pay one buck, three bucks, five bucks for something from sounddogs.com or from soundrangers.com or, or one of those other sound library websites. Um, there's actually another site that I just recently discovered, and I, I started subscribing to this thing. But basically for 99 bucks you have access to this big library at this place called audioblocks.com. And that's a nice little search engine. I want sounds of rivers. I want sounds of steamboats. I want sounds of jet engines. And you can quickly preview and download these things. And I don't know. I, I'm just wondering. I wonder how useful those will be if they will actually supplant all of these very big libraries that mm. are still being sold to individual sound designers as well as to companies. You know, hey, do you need that fifteen thousand dollars sound library um, sitting on your company's server? If you know this this other site is going to have this ninety nine dollar a year web service. I have yeah. a um. I have a, a uh, uh, ethical question for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, at the back room, I was I was needing to do some really quick sounds for a prototype game that they were putting together. So it, it needed to be really really fast. I could you know one or two days to do everything. So I didn't bother doing you know the, the synthesis route because obviously that's just not really practical when you don't have much time. So I went to SoundSnap.com and you know just just basically threw together a couple of things. 
bit of bit of better, you know, bit of balancing, bit of equalization, bit of compression, and then it's all done in like you know a few hours. And I thought, wow, this is really easy. This is great. <laughs> but then I thought to myself, well, I didn't actually do anything here. I just sort of took stuff from SoundSnap.com and just sort of slapped it together, and it sounds really good. And everybody was saying, wow, that sounds really good. It sounds really real. Well, of course it sounds real. They're real recording. But the you know um, because at the end of the day, it's basically just slapping together stuff that other people have put together. And maybe balancing it a little bit, and uh, you know, getting it sounding fitting for the game with the music in the background. Um, I didn't really have that sense of ownership over what I had done the way that I do, where in the other, the main project that we're working on, where it's basically, yeah, I'm creating everything from scratch. So my ethical question for you guys is: uh, Do you ever feel when you are working with sound libraries and sound effects? when you're just sort of banging together sound effects, I wouldn't say banging together, you're delicately arranging, huh. thoughtfully and subtly arranging uh, pre-made recordings from other people. Is there ever a feeling of sort of, um, uh, I wouldn't say guilt, but just sort of, like I said, you don't really feel that sense of ownership over what you've created the way that you would if you'd done everything from scratch? Hmm. I record, I, I use a lot of sounds that are like at a bass level. For instance, if I had to do a fireball, I'll use a sound of somebody. Somebody has recorded fire, you know. Um, I don't. I don't use somebody else's fireball. I use fire from this, maybe some plastic sound that's over here. Something that I could literally go out and record myself if I wanted to. That's that's where I find a sound effects library the most useful. Is it saving me the time from doing something that I could do myself? Because if I went out and recorded fire, it's pretty much going to sound like the fire I just downloaded, you know? Um, because in my mind, I'm looking for a specific sound. And I'm going to record that sound as I, as I imagine it to be in my mind. And if somebody's done that legwork for me, they just save me time. So I don't feel guilty at all about, about the use of sound libraries because I try to use them at kind of an elemental level, if you will. Um, right a glass ting or somebody stepping on glass. You know, those things are going to sound pretty much the same. But mm -hmm. I would never use somebody's sound snap uh, upload that was, you know, a magic spell or something, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to build that out of the fundamentals that I, that I imagine are going to be needed for the sound in the first place. So I imagine what the sound would sound like to me. And then I go and find those samples. And either I've recorded them in some project earlier or I can find them on soundsnap.com, which I also visit a lot, or in some of the libraries that I have. Um, so that, so no, I don't. So on a moral quest, uh, a moral, um, from a moral standpoint, I don't feel bad because I'm not using something that somebody has has created that doesn't already exist. You know, I'm using something that somebody has recorded, but and it takes some creativity to get that recording. But I'm not using something that they they then layered and created some kind of. Um, Essence, from, you know, uh, some kind of ultimate sound of. Does that make if, sense? Yeah. If you're if you're running a freelance gig and somebody's paying you to do sound effects, and you've got this list of assets that you need to create, and you've got one there, and you go through your sound library collection, and mm -hmm. you find from some other third party the perfect sample <laughs> for it, like absolutely perfect. This is yeah. just the way you're imagining it, and you know that the client's going to love it, and it's going to fit the game. Is is, let's say, okay, for one, sure, that's fine. Let's say you're doing this for 10. You've got 20 assets, and 10 of them, you've got something in your library that's just absolutely perfect. Is it then, considering that you're being paid money for this, is it then okay <laughs> to, to go ahead and use that, and the client says, wow, this is perfect, fantastic, thank you, here's your money, and you think, well, oh, great! You know, all I did was just, you know, go into my sound effects library and pick out the ten pre-made samples that somebody else did, and, and it's all good. Is is that? Is, what what do you guys think about that? Well, in truth, I've never had that situation happen. I've certainly heard things that I think are going to be perfect, and, the, and in the end, um, I change them because uh, I I just feel guilty. You know, I can't take somebody else's sound and sell it as my own. I I have a reputation to maintain. You know. Um, mm -hmm. And so, but I will take it as inspiration. I, I, I've done that with Matt Pearsall's stuff. I, he had a spell once that was like ice freezing and chains going and 
And that sound was so amazing that to this day I still think about it. And so sometimes I'll have to ca I, I did some sound effects for the Sirenscape stuff, and one of them was like an ice bolt spell. And immediately I'm thinking of, you know, Matt Pearsall has that perfect sound. I don't have a copy of that sound, but my mind kind of remembers what I think it sounded like, and so I shoot for that. Um, in the end, if I accidentally sounded very similar to him, I... I don't feel guilty about that because I don't have his sound, so I'm just making one basically inspired by him. Excuse me. <clears throat> but, um, but um, I've never ended up in a situation where I found the perfect sound, somebody already created it, and I had access to, to push it forward. And if I did, I would never do that. It's just, I think, bad practice. Hmm. What do you think, Vince? Yeah, it... For this... Hmm. You know, there there you know, is definitely there, a split in my mind in my between mind. film and you know, game, as well as, as well cinematic as and, and game. game. You know, if I was, you know, if I was doing, a doing a cinematic or a, or a car, car, let's, car say, let's say let's say it's a car door slamming, and it's actually not part of the game. It's it's part of a, a cinematic, you know. This the guy is coming out of the door, uh, coming out of the car, and he slams the door. And I just have to find just the right car door slamming for it. Uh, in my mind, because it's not part of the game, because it's part of the cinematic that leads to the actual game, I would feel probably okay about that. Um, sure, uh, it's it, because that's all it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be just a car door slamming. Mm. Uh, maybe it's because I don't really see myself as a film sound designer, so I don't really care about the film sound or the cinematic sound part. But if it was a sound effect that is part of the game where, oh, the character is going to be doing this thing all the time, or it's a, a menu interface sound, the player is going to be listening to this thing all the time, mm -hmm. um, or... You know, something like that, um, or certainly interactive sounds. Uh, you know, I would, I would absolutely want it to be something that I've crafted, uh, and not something that I just find in a library. Maybe that's a, a silly sort of artificial split to put, but it does exist as a split in my mind for some reason. No, it's not silly. I mean, I see what you're saying. You're saying that it's a one-off or two-off. It's really small. It's in the background. We're all on a time budget. Let's find an easy way to get that in there. Yeah. Oh, uh, here's a common example. You know, I need an ambient bed for <laughs> for a city street. Mm -hmm. uh, I can yeah. probably spend a lot of time doing that. Okay, I can go ahead and you know bring out my field recorder and record some city street because I'm in LA. There's plenty of city street out there. But I've got all this library worth of city street, and I find just the right one, and I'll use it. Okay, I, I'm honestly not going to feel bad about that. You know what I've done, though, in that regard? In my career, I've recorded those things. So when I have free time, I know I'm going to need a city street, and so I've recorded. I can literally point you right now to a file that I recorded in Albany. It was a great night. Everything was quiet. I went out and recorded it. Um, gas uh, pipes, hissing, those are things that often are used. And I've recorded those things into my own private library so that I... So that even though you're absolutely right, a city street's a city street no matter who recorded it, I still can say that was my original source material. I guess maybe I'm on the other end of that spectrum in that I'm perhaps overly paranoid about using other people's stuff. Because I don't want to disrespect that person. It's not me being selfish about my reputation, although I did say I have a reputation to maintain, and we all do. It's more about how do you credit that person at the end of the uh, at the end of the game if you ended up using uh, a lot of their material, and so I try to avoid that by just having my own sources. But um, I do use a lot of library stuff, like I said, and I I then take those small original kind of m uh, singular sources and combine them into something bigger that I'm that I'm building. And I don't credit the library or the person because that's the idea of the whole the whole uh, licensing of the library. They're saying use it. Uh, what you can't do is resell it as is, but you can you can use it, combine it, create your own thing out of it, and then and then and then move forward. The licensing for sound effects is really, really pretty simple. It's just if you take our stuff and you build something bigger of it, you don't have to, you know, give 
give us a shout out. But if you, but what you can't do is try to resell our library as as your own. Mm -hmm. That actually how, reminds how me. Oh. Go ahead. Oh, Alex. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, actually, <laughs> last week this is kind of timely, but Unreal uh, Epic Mega Games they actually put out a really big library of stuff just all sorts of different assets that were made for an Infinity Blade game that ultimately is not going to be released. So they put all this stuff on the Unreal Engine marketplace. Uh, models, textures, scripts, and sounds even. However, for the sounds, after it was put on the marketplace, they quickly took it down because they realized that a lot of the sounds that were in oh. that pack are actually pretty much library sounds that they were not free to actually distribute in that manner. So I don't know if it's still the case, but for quite a few days after they did that, the mm -hmm. sound pack uh, on Unreal Marketplace is still not available. That's interesting. I mean, there's a, there's a topic right there. How many big games are just straight-up library sounds? That's embarrassing in some ways to me. I would think, as a sound designer... I don't want my name on that if I just started pushing some some library sounds forward and then, you know, said it was Yeah. Good. It looks like it's there's still a listing for it on the Unreal Engine marketplace, but you can't actually download and activate it anymore. So there's a recent comment from yesterday, product activation failed. It looks like they're still trying to uh, Russell through all the content there and try to figure out which ones they actually have license to distribute and which ones they don't. It, it's kind of embarrassing, honestly. So I found uh, a bunch of my sound effects out on the internet under somebody. Uh, out, and to tell you the truth, it was two different people's names. And wow. I, my demo reels have a password so that people can't steal them because that's what they basically did was lift it. Because you can use things like... Um, I use a tool all the time to capture audio called, um, I'm looking it up in case it's useful to people. Um, what is it called? It's Audio Showton? <laughs> of course, Audio Hijack Pro. Oh, and, yeah. You know, you can use tools like that to just target an application that's open on your machine, hit play, and record a live concert that you're not supposed to technically be able to record. And you didn't hear that here. And if you do say you hear that here, you heard it from Vince. You didn't hear it from me. So, um, that's in the bylaws in the, in the small print of this this movie. So, um, but anyways, a couple of people had lifted some sounds and put them out there, and I was alerted to them because there was a sound pack being sold. I'm not going to say where, and it had a bunch of my sound effects in it. And so this person was selling them on one of those online locations and making money off of sound effects that I had done. Mm -hmm. And that's that's really kind of crappy, right? So you got to be careful about this stuff because. Uh, that is the number one thing that libraries are trying to avoid is don't take our sounds and repurpose them and then sell them as your own, which apparently un, uh, Unreal had to go, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. These We're now discovering that these sounds are pretty much straight out of the library. I, you know, I don't think Unreal knew that when they published the game. That's up to the audio director to be in charge of watching and, and talk to their legal department to make sure everything's in the clear. But you guys yourself, you, you've experienced this when you uh, when you turn in the final... Have you guys... Well, let me not make any assumptions. Have you guys dealt with that list that you have to turn into legal saying this is the libraries from which I got these sounds? Uh, none of them are straight up, you know, from the library. Uh, I, I, I've certainly had to do it. I assume that it happens at every game company. Yeah, I had to do that for Sony. So, you know, they cared about that. But yeah, I had to do that. Unreal so, dropped the ball. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead, Alex. I said I had to do it. It was a pretty short list, like nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This synthesizer created that. See, you're safe, Alex, because with with creating these. So, so I see, I see what you're doing, Alex, as like. I used to be a programmer, right? And there were people who would not build web pages with any kind of WYSIWYG kind of programming thing. They would open up Notepad or whatever, and type in the HTML, hit save, load it in a browser. In some ways, Alex, <laughs> I have just described your approach to creating sounds. What's great about that is that there is no ambiguity about where you're getting these sounds from. Right. Which is fantastic. Actually, yeah. 
Actually, you, you you just described my web design process back when I used to do web design about uh, like eight years ago. It's like, no, I'm not going to use Dreamweaver. I'm not going to use um, Go Live. Does you remember Adobe Go Live? I do remember Adobe Go Live. I do. Yeah. I do. And I used well, I'm to not going to use that. I'm going to. I love it. myself. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I stepped on your line. Yeah. Um, it comes from, uh, for me personally, it's not that relevant, but it comes from, you know, back in the early days with the Amiga, right? The, all of the, the very early Amiga mods sourced their sounds from two floppy disks. There were two floppy disks that had sampled sounds from the D50 and the DX7. Hold on. We and... have to explain what a floppy disk is. Oh. It's like um, this little kind of blue I'm plastic kidding. thing. You, it's called physical media. You put it inside the computer. There is a point at which that will be needed. An explanation of <laughs> floppy disk will be needed. Anyway, the, um, the, the early songs were all created using these two sounds from these two floppy disks, right? So in the early days of Amiga, Amiga Music, you would listen to mods that were created by somebody, and instantly you could say, oh, that's that sound, that's that sound. How unoriginal. All you did was just take the default sounds and make a song out of it. And then, you know, there would be guys who had actually uh, wired up their own PC board digitizer. Oh, yeah, the digitizer, which plugs in the SCSI port at the back of the Amiga. Or is it the parallel port? One of those two. Vince will remember. Um, the, uh, it's a parallel plug port. In the, the digitizer, and now you can sample at like 8-bit, whatever it was, 22.05 kilohertz or something like that. Um, uh, and now, when you get these mods that came out with with uh, sounds that weren't from the two default, it was ST01 and ST02 were the names of the discs that you get from uh, some shady bulletin board in Denmark somewhere. Um, the Now, when you get these mods that didn't have those sounds, it was like complete, even if it was terrible music, it was completely amazing because, wow, these are original sounds. And so, because that's the kind of the... I guess the context that I grew up in, you know, thanks to my brother who was always very generous in letting me use, use his uh, Amiga, um, it's like, this is a, these are original sounds. And so growing up with that context then, automatically you feel very adverse to using even something like a synthesizer preset. Even <laughs> these companies put, you know, thousands of dollars into getting these famous sound designers to come and make these banks of presets. Yeah, for, for me, it's terrible. It's like so inefficient. It's <laughs> it's so masochistic. Oh you know, yeah. It's like, uh, yeah, Alex, we need the sound of like a you know a a, a chain chain mail. Give us some chain mail. Like okay, so I'm trying to think. Okay, how do I make chain mail? So I need to do this and then do that and then do this <laughs> and that. And maybe, I use, maybe use that synth, but that one doesn't sound very good. So I use this one and I can't quite get it. And now, like you know, two hours later, here's your chain mail, guys. I made it. So you're not like, the guy for one of those uh, game jams, right? Like Alex, our audio dude for a game jam. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think... Uh, How long is this game jam? Is it a 30-day game jam? <laughs> That's right. I'm, I'm pretty pretty, pretty quick now, Kyle, after like all this practice of doing in this kind of masochistic way. It's, it doesn't hurt so much anymore. You get used Fair to the enough. pain. Fair enough. I apologize to paint you in a negative light there because it, it is impressive the way you approach those things. And I love synthesis. Don't get me wrong. I, I do what you do, but for music. I don't do that for sound design. I, I'm always trying to get out to the Moog and figure out, you know, some patching and try to go, all right, I've got this new sound. That's the best, man. That feeling, that that what what happens internally when you've discovered or you've created something um, that, you know, you know nobody's heard before. And that's what I like about sound design, frankly, more than composition, is that is the creative art in game audio, in my opinion. This is my opinion. Whenever, and I've said it before, whenever I've been asked to do a soundtrack, which I love doing, so please keep asking, um, I find myself working very hard to kind of put the Kyle Johnson uh, creativity into something because they already have an idea of what they want to hear. And I'm, I'm, I'm spending probably 60 to 70% of the time um, trying to create something that somebody else, John Williams, whoever, has already created and they're using as temps and then spend the other 30% of my time trying to sound like that which is difficult and then and then also have my little edge to it you know and the way I like to do things so that it is mine in the end but basically it's just me trying to recreate a sound that they have as a temp and and um, that is challenging in itself because my goodness it's hard to sound like some of these amazing composers who which of which I am not 
But on sound design, you know, uh, I constantly get, uh, I don't think I've had a project that said, I want my gun to sound like Call of Duty, or I want my, you know, spells to sound like Dia uh, Diablo or, or something like that. It's always the opposite of, I do not want to sound like this game. We want to stand out. We want this to be unique. And with that, the creativity is just exploding when you're doing sound design. And when you're doing <coughs> composition for me, it's on. It's a little. It's it's too much of trying to sound like something that already exists. It, um, what advice would you give to uh, freelancers who are just starting out, specifically wanting to go into sound design? How do you convince people that you are worth the money when it's so easy for a you know somebody who's not a professional sound designer in game audio? It's so easy to just go to yeah, like SoundSnap.com. There's so many fantastic resources just for, you know, um, getting really well recorded sounds that you can just drop into your game immediately. You don't really need to know much about, um, uh, you know, balancing EQ or compression or anything like that. You, you, or you can just sort of uh, take these sounds, put them right in. Maybe just as a, a simple aesthetic judgment that anybody can make about, you know, balancing the volumes. That one's too loud. This one's too soft. Mm. Yeah. Um, I do, have, I do have a strong opinion in that, in that regard, actually. And how does it, like, a, new, a new freelance sound effects designer go about convincing people that, well, instead of going to SoundSnap but, or wherever and getting these samples yourself, you pay me this much money and I'll give you this much quality? How, yeah. how do you go about convincing people of that? So I absolutely, if you don't mind me getting up on that soapbox for just a second, it, sound design really musters people out because it looks simple. And then when you get in there and you start making them, there is an education in there that is really rich and really deep. And I will never be as good as, as my heroes in sound design, uh, some of which join us on the show, like Matt and his crew. They do some amazing work. There's a level of creativity that you really have to reach for when you're doing sound design that, it, that kind of goes against what you're naturally doing. A lot of sound designers are musicians, and so they go, okay, I'm going to approach this with a, min, a musician's kind of attitude, and you can't. You have to approach sound design from a technical, scientific kind of, what makes a bubble, you know? What is the, how is a bubble, what does a bubble sound like? And you got to understand what the components of a bubble are, as you described earlier. And <clears throat> if you... If you lack that kind of um, scientific knowledge or if you don't educate yourself in those degrees, then you'll, you'll lean on your musical side, and your musical side isn't going to serve you necessarily well when it comes to sound design. Now, that being said, that is my weakest area of sound design is musical sound design. Uh, people that are fantastic at that are like... Um, uh, what's uh, what's the name of the guy who did the PopCap games? He's fantastic at doing oh, well, music. Guy Whitmore? Yeah, Guy Whitmore is fantastic at musical sound design. And that's something where I, I don't excel at, even though I'm a musician, because I don't you know hear those sounds in a musical way. But I feel that I do do well when it comes to trying to create a fantastic version of something that's realistic, a car door. Or uh, you know, or if I'm creating a spell and a spell's based on fire, and I think I do well there, but I don't do well at trying to create a musical version of a spell that's based on fire. And Guy Whitmore would just knock it out of the park every time. So I think that sound design really will will um will really muster out people who are trying to kind of find an easy way in. So if you have an interest in it. You know, learn your biology, learn your chemistry, learn learn things about how things work, um, and it very much is good for people who are, who have an interest in programming because that's about learning how things work. You know, so that you can you can emulate that in code. And when you when you when you do that, and uh, I think that you're going to serve yourself really well in sound design is to learn how things work, what the components are that make them up. Now. Then there's a level above that where you can start to incorporate that musical knowledge and you can reach those Guy Whitmore levels and you can start in those Matt Pearsall levels and you can go, okay, now I can take this thing and really have fun with it. You know, like cartoons rely so much on musical sound effects. Um, but, but to answer your question, I think that the first thing that you have to approach is from a scientific standpoint... Uh, let your musical side go to the go to the go to the side. Let your musical self go to the side while you figure out how to do sound design from a bass level, and then from a fantastic fantasy level, and then and then start to incorporate some kind of musical level into it. Yeah, I, I pretty much agree with all of that. Yeah, understanding those 
those machinations. And I think just to extend from that, uh, the fact that a lot of modern games, the those crazy machinations are now part of what's going to be gamed with 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 modern games, with modern technology. So um, you know. Uh, actually implementing, you know, learning implementation and using implementation to actually create sound that even further connects to the, the, the machinations of the contraptions that are inside of your video game world. So, you know, uh, making actions that are connected with um, a transforming robot, and the transforming robot has limbs that have a certain length, but that length is variable. And then there are other actions that are connected with that. And then you deal with things like, you know, parameters. You deal with the possibility of data inheritance for sound effects that are parenting other sound effects. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, you know, so even if you don't, uh, aren't necessarily of a mind that really understands all the things that go on in order to create a sound, um, like diving really deeply into the possibilities of interactive sound implementation can get you started on that really, really quickly, I think. Yeah, and another good point that Vince brings up that I want to, well, that Vince kind of alluded to that I want to bring up is when you look at a, a library, study how they have organized the sounds because that's basically, in some ways, the scientific breakdown of sound. You know, they might have a list of risers or they might have a list of, you know, I, can't, I don't have something in front of me right now. But I did want to speak about how I have, by looking at how professional sound library companies have, have organized their sounds, almost tells you how to put them together. Impact sounds, debris sounds, and you realize that a gun firing <clears throat> is different, obviously, than a gun impacting something. But a lot of people will think that I just need to have a bullet hitting something, you know. Well, no, there's a, there's after. There's debris, depending upon if you hit a concrete wall or you hit a brick a wood uh, wall or if you hit a f piece of flesh, all of that has debris afterwards. You know, and I, it was because of libraries and looking at how they organized things that debris even entered my mentality as, as a, a part of a sound design. So study the library organization as well. I think that's very important. Yeah, I'll definitely say that acoustic science, like basic acoustic science, is uh, uh, not only is it fascinating and really exciting, that it's so useful, um, you know. Then going in, whether your your primary tool of the of the trade is sampling, or whether your primary tool is uh, like synthesis in my case, or whether it's actually just recording, uh, sample mangling, or even you know you're an expert at putting together third party sounds in really interesting odd ways. Um, it all comes down to understanding how a sound is created and how. Uh, yeah, it basically understanding the core principles of what is producing the sound, what is vibrating the air, how is that reaching your ears, what does it go through to get to your ears, all of these kinds of issues. Is it behind you? Is it in front of you? Is it on this side? What does that mean for a sound on that side? And oh, yeah. all of those kinds of you know um, basic acoustic science principles. Are mm -hmm. Another practice that you can do, and I did this for, um, and I guess it's safe to say, I don't see why it wouldn't be, so I applied for Kojima and did really well through the process. This was like a year or something ago. I didn't get the gig, but um, I had the best experience interviewing for that job. And I learned a lesson in that that I will take to my grave and I wanted to pass it on here. And that was to create soundscapes without any visuals. Practice that as often as possible. And the reason I thought of that is because you were talking about positioning of audio and stuff like that. When I create a spell, I don't think about it's just a stereo file, right? I don't. It might have some movement back and forth. I'll give you that. Um, but when I'm thinking about a soundscape now, and I'm in five one, which is what I had to do for Kojima, I was like, "What? This is amazing." I I never really considered that how intense that is to try to create a complete scene no visuals and you have to tell the whole story and uh, man I can't I can't uh, recommend that enough to people who are coming into sound design you will learn so much from going into a 5-1 space learning how to position stuff and then when you go into the world and you get your gig and you're doing a stereo sound effect library for some game all of that knowledge is going to is going to just dance around your brain 
as you're creating all of these sounds, and it's really going to up your game. Mm, great advice. And also, um, in the chat room, uh, um, who is it? Is it the legendary Mr. Reynolds, or is it Matt? Somebody... Um, uh, ah, Matt is saying the sound designer is needed to ensure the continuity of the aesthetic, which I think continuity of the aesthetic... Dan Reynolds then says, it's not a strong argument if there is a strong audio direction from the non-audio people or if they're purchasing a pre-made library. And it's true, but um, as Vince then says, it's really <laughs> important to create some kind of identity. And how you do that, it comes back to workflow. You know, the ad identity may come about naturally just because of the way that you like to do things. Like, you know, I'm pretty fortunate. That's ha what happened to me just because it's the, the really strange way that I like to work kind of creates that identity. But... Um, I would say, yeah, what advice would you give people for, uh, for um, creating their own identity when they're in sound design? I mean, beyond just the, the organic way of doing it, that is just working a whole lot and eventually arriving at it, uh, what advice would you give? Or is it something that people shouldn't really try to force out? No, well, I think process is really important. I, I think that's why I started out with that question of, I used to do things this way, and now I do things a different way, because there's a really strong connection, uh, a subtle but strong connection between process and the actual sound that comes out of you. You know, so you know, we know with, with the music, uh, the, the soft sense that you use inform the type of music that you write. You know, I'm using these contact libraries, or, oh, I'm using Reactor, or, you know, th that changes the overall sound of the music that you have. I think the same thing also happens with sound effects design and being cognizant of your process and how your process is actually changing and how it's improving because if you work at it it's going to improve you you recognize that you're stretching certain muscles and you're not using these other muscles but that's okay because these new projects that you're working on they're great for these muscles that you're developing right now that you've developed the last six months the, the last year um, so I think you know, actually paying attention to the process that you're doing and not just willy-nilly going through and, oh, I'll grab a library sound and plop it into FMOD there. That's not, that's not actually learning how to design sound, but, you know, figuring out how it is that you actually go and, and do these things because there, there are so many things that can be done and yeah, knowing those options and deciding to do certain things as opposed to other things and that's what creates your identity. Absolutely. And, you know, I wanted to say that uh, I just saw a video by Diego Stucco who um, put a bunch of mics on his fingers and started tapping things. I've never thought to do that. But that's why that guy's a genius. And those explorations that you make doing stuff like that, in addition to what Vince is saying, but uh, backing up at that kind of recording level where you're, where you're creating your assets, not you have assets and you're doing things with them, but you're actually at the point where you want to create some assets. Understanding what things sound like and doing experiments that are outside of the box. Don't be afraid to look weird with your headphones on and your uh, your microphone pointed at a car as it drives past your driveway. You know, don't don't worry about that. People are going to judge you for the cl the shirt you're wearing more than they're going to judge you. Know, if you were standing out there in your shorts, they're going to judge you on your shorts. So just let it go. Just go on out there in your silliness. Put microphones on your fingers and start tapping your trees around your front yard. People think you're crazy anyway. Don't worry about it. I'm the nut in my neighborhood. I, I accept it fully. But, but by being creative and allowing those things to happen, you know, I never thought to do that, and Diego has this now collection of sounds that he's put into his library of awesomeness that came off of just going, hey, I think I'll tape some mics to my fingers. So, so go out there and experiment. That is the love and the awesomeness of sound design. You don't get that opportunity. I can't say, hey, I think I'm going to go record a Stradivarius today when you're doing music. Or, hey, I think I'm going to gather up you know, uh, Aerosmith and see if they can lay down some of their kind of chunky tunes for me. That's not going to happen. But if you want to do it in sound design, it's all right there for you. There's no limitations except something legal. We do not promote anything legal. And if you think that we did, send emails to Vince at thatgamecompany.com because I didn't say it. But um, <laughs> Vince just ducked his head for those who can't see the show. I blame him for all the crazy stuff. But anyway, so that's what's great about sound design and I'm speeding up because I know we're getting towards the end of the show. Yeah, I would wow. agree. I think uh, just one last comment there. I would say 
Uh, Dan has a good point. You know, I asked Dan in the chat room. He's saying that when you're a beginner, your voice will only come through a lot of exploration and personal discovery. Uh, and I was asking, is it a good idea? Is it not productive for beginners to try too hard to make a distinct personal sound because they heard that that's a good idea for sound designers? Uh, Dan is saying that he recommends mimicry in the beginning because you can't understand what a voice is until you try to impersonate people. Um, I'd also add to that, don't overthink things too much. You know, I think uh, trust your own, uh, this sounds really pretentious coming from somebody of my limited experience, but I would say trust your own, uh, trust your own musicality and your own assessment of sound quality and just work to that. Don't overthink it, just do the work. You know, if you have a whole list of 20 sound effects to make, just do them and don't think too much about, oh, I have to make it sound individual or I have to, I can't use sample, uh, you know, um, commercial sound libraries and, uh, oh, somebody, some idiot on Game Audio Hour said I should be synthesizing this and trying to think about the psychoacoustics and acoustic science of all of this. Don't worry about that, you know, just get it done. And I think if you do that enough times, eventually on the way, you'll start sort of, uh, you'll start um, sort of thinking, well, maybe actually this can be a bit like that, or I think I prefer this to be this way, or last time I did it like that, but it didn't go very well, so I think I'll do it this way. And as after, you know, time, that workflow will, will come about as will, and then because of that, you know, that kind of sound identity, and then people eventually will say, oh, that's stuff by Carl Johnson, or that's stuff by that, <laughs> that sound guy at that game company. <laughs> you know, I agree with you com completely, and from, as a guitarist, I see things from a guitar standpoint. There are so many guitarists out there who create a sound, and I'm just, I'm just echoing what Alex has said, that create a sound that you can identify them as soon as you hear them. Uh, uh, Carlos Santana, you know the minute he's playing a guitar lead, you know it's Carlos Santana, even though you're listening to it on the radio. Now, Carlos Santana didn't pick up a guitar and say, I'm going to be Carlos Santana, and I'm going to create a way that everybody identifies me as Carlos Santana. And his tools are being used by billions of people. I think it's safe to say there's a billion guitar players in the world, if not quite a few. Um, so it's not like he's been given some kind of special piece of equipment that easily makes it identifiable as his. And so the same thing goes with sound design. You're going, having a sound that is yours, nobody, in any game that I've done sound design for, and I've done lots, is going to say that was a Kyle Johnson sound design. Um, th that lends itself more in a musical realm, in my humble opinion, than a sound design opinion. But there is a process flow, there is a delivery, there is a style that the client knows that they're going to get when they hear the games that I've worked on. So they may hire me and say, hey, you did sound design for X, didn't you? And I'll say, yeah, I did. And they'll say, we really like that sound design. Your spells sound great or whatever. And uh, they don't know it's me when they that same client listens to another game that I've worked on. They don't know who did that. But it's because of the fact that the game echoed, or the, the sounds echoed the game's mentality, it was something that they enjoyed, because that's the end result, right? We have to make that game even more enjoyable, that they will find out who did it. And, and I think it's less about they can identify a sound as being mine, but more about, hey, that, that, that Kyle Johnson luckily has been doing a bunch of games that we really like, we should probably go see if he's there. And so the same thing happens with sound design or with uh, identifying sounds based on guitarists, is you go, hey, I really like this this sound, and and you may go, oh wait, that's Carlos Santana who keeps playing those parts. You know, whether it's a, a Santana album, which maybe that makes this a bad example, or it's that hit that he had with th you know three different singers from three different walks of life in, uh, back in the back in the early 2000s. You can just identify his sound, and so you seek him out because you like that sound. I think that that's the point I'm trying to make, is that if you work really hard and you land some contracts and you're doing games that people enjoy, people will seek you out. It's I don't know if it's much about they'll identify the sound as being yours, but more about the games that they enjoy, they keep finding your name on the credits. Agreed. Is that my crazy, crazy way of talking? Because I think I heard myself go crazy. I think that's... Thumbs up for me. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, hey, uh, Grandpa Johnson has ended with his speech for the night. I seem to do that a lot. Like, there needs to be a fireside, and I need to go, well, back in my day, there, I feel like my age is creeping up on me. So uh, uh, I was just going to say, hey, thanks. Thanks, everybody, for sticking with us through the um, the, the Twitch tryouts. That was not very great. That didn't go well. <laughs> I wouldn't be. I wouldn't pretend to say that. You know, 
Uh, that was a nightmare. So we are definitely going to tell that to kiss our behinds and uh, maybe try again uh, later times. Uh, I already gave the speech at the beginning about what we have to go through to do it. And I, I think I'm just comfortable. I feel like I'm home when we're using Google Hangouts. And uh, that doesn't mean we're not going to complain about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's like that's like going to Thanksgiving and saying I love my family. I'm not going to say anything bad about them. They're still crazy, but at least we're going to spend Thanksgiving <laughs> with them. So um, that is the deal on Hangouts. Please like us on Facebook and tweet us on Twitter. And I guess you don't have to twitch us anymore. It's just on Twitch. They really should create the itch on Twitch, right? Is that good marketing slang right there? It's probably already being done. Vince, Vince just cocked his head to the side like a dog that gets confused, which I, I posted on Facebook this meme. It had a bunch of dogs looking sideways and the teacher and a dog teacher at the blackboard writing something and he goes and he says, By the look of all the head tilts, I guess I better explain this again. <laughs> Man. You know, head tilting is actually really awesome because it's a it's an amazing way to get a better understanding of your 3D aural sound space that you exist in, you know. That's and why that, that's, that. that's why people do that, you know, with uh, I mean, I mean you, you've done that, right? I'm not the only one that does this. No, but, I do it all the time. This yeah, you you fire. listen to something and you do that and yeah. you you're literally just moving your ears into different places so that you can actually get an even better understanding of where this thing is. Oh yeah, um, sirens do that to me all the time because they they got that pitch that's everywhere. It's like a perfect pitch that reflects off of every surface, and so I I move my head to try to figure out what side of the road that siren is on. You know, absolutely, uh, it, it's great. But right. oh man, or or if you want to look like a dog, it's good for that too. So it, I'm it is hang out now. <laughs> And I'm going to eat my spaghetti dinner because it's classic spaghetti night. Ooh, classic spaghetti night. Yeah. It, is it always classic spaghetti night, or do you sometimes do spaghetti Alfredo? Or no, no. Like to tell you, my my wife is is uh, of Italian and Irish descent, because so Ooh. you can imagine the the spaghetti and the beer that is in that is going to happen as soon as I hit the stop broadcast button. Ooh. It's pretty amazing, but actually, I got to tell you the truth. Tonight is uh, stuffed bell peppers. Oh, right. Ooh. I like stuffed bell peppers as well. Hey, uh, when are we no. being invited over to dinner? You know, we should we. We we have never had a game audio hour get together. Well, we my kind of house. We, we last year, or not at your house? No. We need to do that. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it now. I'll just get on the plane. Let's do it. Don, I'll see you when you get here. Let me know. Just knock. I don't care what hour it is. Okay. Okay, bye, everybody. I'll hold you to that. Bye. Bye. I'm in.